Hello guys, today I'm going to be reading Ready Player One, Chapter Two, or Chapter One, the other one was Level One, or I don't know how it works, but yeah, Chapter One. Let me just get to it. I was jolted awake by the sound of gunfire in one of the neighboring stacks. The shots were followed by a few of muffled shouting and screaming, then silence. Gunfire wasn't uncommon in the stacks, but it still shook me up. I knew I probably wouldn't be able to fall back asleep, so I decided to kill the remaining hours until dawn by brushing up on a, a few coin op cla classics. A Galaga, Defender, Asteroids. These games were outdated, digital dinosaurs that had become museum pieces long before I was born. But I was a gunter, so I didn't think of them as quant low res antiques. To me, they were hollowed artifacts. Pillars of Pantheon. When I played the classics, I did so with a determined sort of reference. I, w I was curled up, curled up in an old sleeping bag in the corner of the trailer's tiny laundry room, wedged into the gap between the wall and the dryer. I wasn't welcome in my aunt's room across the hall, which was fine by me. I preferred to crash in the laundry room anyway. It was warm. It afforded me a limit, a limited amount of privacy, and the wireless reception wasn't too bad. And as an added bonus, the room smelled like liquid detergent and fabric softener. The rest of the trailer reeked of cat pee and ob object poverty. Most of the time, I slept in my hideout. But the temperature had dropped below zero the past few nights. And as much as I hated staying at my aunt's place, it still beats freezing to death. A total of 15 people lived in my aunt's tra trailer. She slept in, a, in the smallest of its three bedrooms. The DeBerts lived in a bedroom adjutant to hers. And the Millers occupied the large master bedroom at the end of the hall. There were six of them, and they paid the largest share of the rent. Our trailer wasn't as crowded as some of the other units in the stack stacks. It was a double wide, plenty of room for everybody. I pulled out my laptop and powered it on. It was bulky, heavy beast, almost ten years old. I found it in a trash bin behind the abandoned strip mall across the highway. I had been able to coax it back to life by replacing its system memory and reloading Stone Age operating system. The processor was slower than a sloth by current standards, but it was fine for my needs. The laptop served as, an, as my portable research library video. Arcade and home theater system. It, its hard drive was filled with old books, movies, and TV show episodes, long files, and nearly every video game made it, made in the 20th century. I booted up my emulator and selected Robotron 2084, one of my all time, all time favorite, favorite games. I love, I loved its frinket frequented pace and brutal sim simplicity. Uh, I can't say it. Robotron was all about the instinct and reflexes. Paying, oh, playing old video games never failed to clear my mind and set me at ease. If I was, if I was feeling depressed or frustrated about a lot of my life, all I had to do was tap the player one button and my worries would instantly slip away as my mind focused on itself its focused itself on relentless pit 
pixelated onslaught on the screen in front of me. Just you against the ma machine. Move with your left hand, shoot with your right hand. Try to stay as long as try to stay alive as long as possible. I spent a few hours blasting through wave after wave of brains, spiritoids, quarks, and hulks in my unintending battle to save the last human family. But eventually my hate fingers started to cramp up. I began to lose my rhythm. When that all, when when that happened, this level things deteriorated quickly. I burned through all of my extra lives in a matter of minute, minutes, and my two least favorite words appeared on the screen. Game over. I shut down the emulator and began to browse through my video files. Over the past five years, I downloaded every single movie, TV show, and cartoon mentioned in Anorax Almanac. I still haven't hadn't watched all of them yet, of course. That that would probably take decades. I selected an episode of Family Ties, an 80s sitcom about a middle class family living in central Ohio. I downloaded I downloaded the show because it had been one of Holiday's favorites. I figured there was a chance that some clue related to the hunt might be hitting in, hidden in one of the episodes. I become addicted to the show immediately and how in and, and now watched all eight eight one one hundred and eighty episodes multiple times. I never seem to get tired of them sitting alone in the dark watching the show on my laptop. I always found myself imagining that I lived in a warm, well lit house and that those smiling, understanding people were my family. That there was nothing so wrong in the world that we couldn't sort it out by the end of a single half-hour episode, or maybe a two-parter if it was something really serious. My own home life had never been remotely reassembled. The one dispissated in family tides which was probably why I loved the show so much. I was an, the only child of two teenagers, both refugees, who met in the stacks where I had grown up. I don't remember my father, but when I was a few months old, he was shot dead. While looking at a grocery store during a power blackout, the only thing I really knew about him was that he loved comic books. I found several old fla flash drives and a box of his things. It, wait, no. I found several, yeah, flash drives and a box of his things containing the runs of The Amazing Spider-Man, The X-Men, and Green Lantern. My mom once told me that my dad had given me an alternative name, Wade Walt, Walt, Watts, because he thought it sounded like a secret identity of a superhero like Peter Parker or Clark Kent knowing that he made me think think he was he must have been a cool guy despite his despite how he died my mother loretta raised me on her uh, on her own we lived in a small rv in another part of the stacks she had two full-time oasis jobs one as a telemarketer and the other as an escort and online brothel she used to make me wear earplugs at night so I wouldn't hear her in the next room talking. Dirty to tricks, to tricks and other time zones. But earplugs didn't work very well. So I would watch old movies instead. With my volume turned way up, I was introduced to the Oasis in an early age because my mother used it as a virtual babysitter. As soon as I was old enough to wear a visor and a pair of haptic gloves, <coughs> my mom helped me create a first Oasis avatar. Then she stuck me in a quarter and went back to work, leaving me to explore an entirely new world, very different from the one I'd know up until then. 
Hmm. Up until then, from that moment on, I was more or less raised by the Oasis interactive educational pro programs, which any kid could access for free. I spent a big chunk of my childhood hanging out in a virtual reality simulation of Sesame Street, singing songs with friendly Muppets, and playing interactive games. That taught me how to walk, talk, add, subtract, read, write, and share. Once I'd mastered those skills, it didn't take me very long to discover that the Oasis was also the world's biggest public library. With a even a penny, penniless kid like me had access to every book every ever written, every song ever recorded, every movie, television show, video game, and piece of artwork wait, piece of artwork ever created. The collective knowledge, art, and amuse, amusements of all human civilization were there. Wait, were there waiting for me? But, but gaining access to all that information turned out to be something of a mixed blessing because that was when I found the truth. I don't know, maybe your experience is different from mine, but for me, growing up as a human, being on planet Earth in the 21st century was a real kick in the teeth. Ex Exently speaking, the worst thing about a being a kid is that no one told me the truth about my situation. In fact, they did the exact opposite, and of course I believed them. Because I was just a kid, I didn't know any better. I mean, Christ, my brain hadn't even grown to full size yet. So how could I be expected to know when adults were bullshitting me? So I swallowed all of the dark ages nonsense they fed me. Sometimes I passed, some time passed, I grew up a little. Then I gradually began to figure out that pretty much everyone had been lying to me about pretty much everything since the moment I emerged from my mother's womb. This was an enlarging revelation. It gave me trust issues later in life. I started to figure out the ugly truth as soon as I began to explore the old free oasis libraries. The facts were the facts were right there waiting for me, hidden in old books written by people who weren't afraid to be honest. Artists, scientists, and philosophers, and poets, many of them long dead. As I read the words they left behind, I finally began to get a grip on the situation, my situation, our situation, what most people refer to as the human condition. It was not always good. It was not good we news. I wish someone had just told me the truth right up front as soon as I was old enough to understand it. I wish someone just said, Here's the deal, Wade. You're something called a human being that a really smart kind of animal, like every other animal on this planet, were descendants from a single-celled organism that lived millions of years ago. This happens by a process called evolution, and you learn more about it later. But trust me, that's really how we all got here. There's proof of it everywhere. Buried in rocks. That story you heard about, we were all created by a super powerful dude named God who lives up in the sky. Total BS. The, the whole God thing is actually an ancient fairy tale that people have been telling one another for thousands of years. We also made it all up like Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny. Oh, by the way, there is no Santa Claus or Easter Bunny. Also BS. Sorry, kids. Deal with it. You're probably wondering what happened before you got here. An awful lot of stuff. Actually, once we evolved to humans, things got pretty interesting. We figured out how to grow food and domesticate animals so we didn't have to spend all our time hunting. Our tribes got much bigger and we spread across the entire planet like an unstoppable virus. Them fighting a bunch of wars with each other. 
land, each, each other over land and resources and, and our made up gods. We eventually got all of our tribes organized into a global civilization. But honestly, it wasn't all that organized or civilized. And we continued to fight a lot of wars with each other, but we also figured out how to do science, which helped us develop technology for a bunch of hairless apes. We actually managed to invent some pretty incredible things. Computers, medicine, lasers, microwave ovens, artificial hearts, atomic bombs. We even sent a few guys to the moon and brought them back. We also created a global, global communications network that let us all talk to each other all around the world all the time. Pretty impressive, right? But that's where the bad news comes in. Our global, our goal, uh, I can't talk today. Our global civilization came at a huge cost. We needed a whole bunch of energy to build it. And we got that energy by burning fossil fuel, fuels, which came from dead plants and animals buried deep in the ground. We used most of this fuel before you got here. And now it's pretty much all gone. This means that we no longer have enough energy to keep our civilization running like it was before. So we had to cut back big time. We call this global energy crisis. And it's been going on for a while now. Also, it turns out that burning all those fossil fuels had some nasty size, side effects. Like raising the temperature of our planet and screwing up the environment. So now, the polar ice caps are melting, sea levels are rising, and, and the weather is all messed up. Plants and animals are dying off in r record num numbers, and lots of people are starving and homeless. And we're still fighting wars with each other, mostly over the few resources we have. Basically, kid, what, what this all means is that life got a lot tougher than it used to be in the good old days back before you were born things used wait things used to be t awesome but now they're kind of terrifying to be honest future doesn't look too bright you were born at a pretty crappy pretty crappy time in this history and it looks like things are only going to get worse from here on out human civil civilization is in decline. Some people even say it's collapsing. You're probably wondering what's going to happen to you. That's easy. The same thing's going to happen to you that has happened to every other human being who's ever lived. You're going to die. We all die. That's just how it happens. What happens when you die? Well, we're not completely sure. But the evidence seems to suggest that nothing happens. You're, you're you're di you're just dead. Your brain stops working, and then you're not around to around to ask annoying questions anymore. Those stories you heard about going to a wonderful place called heaven, there's the where there's no more pain and death, and and you live forever in a state of per perpetual yeah. happiness. Sorry, I can't talk. Also, total BS. Just like all that God stuff, there's no evidence of heaven. That, that, and they were never was. We made that up too. Wishful thinking. So now you have to live the rest of your life knowing you're going to die someday and disappear forever. Sorry. Okay, on a second thought, maybe honestly, honestly isn't the best policy after all. Maybe it's a good idea to tell a newly arrived human being that he's born into a world of chaos, pain, and poverty just in time to watch everything fall to pieces. I discovered all of that gradually over several years and it still made me feel like jumping off a bridge. Luckily, I had access to the Oasis, which is like having an escape hatch into a better reality. The Oasis kept me sane. I was my playground and my preschool, a magical place where anything was possible. The Oasis is setting 
all the setting of all my happiness childhood memories when my mom didn't have to work we could log in at the same time and play games or go on interactive storybook adventures see and she used to she used to have forced me to log out every night because i never wanted to return to the real world but because the real world sucked i never blamed my mom for the way things were she was a victim of fate cruel circumstances like everyone else her generation had it had it the hardest she'd been born in a world into a world of plenty she had to watch it all slowly vanish more than anything i remember feeling sorry for her she was depressed all the time and taking drugs seemed to be the only thing she had truly enjoyed of course that were what they were what eventually killed her when i was 11 years old she shot a bad batch of something into her arm and died on our ratty fold out sofa bed while listening to christmas music on an old mp3 player i repaired and given to wait i old mp3 player i repaired and given it to her the previous Christmas. That was when I had to move in with my mom's sister Alice. Aunt Alice didn't take care of me in in out of kindness or fam familial responsibility. She did it to get the extra food vouchers from the government every month. Most of the time I had to find food on my own. This usually wasn't the problem because I had a talent for finding and fixing old computers and busted Oasis consoles, which I sold to pawn shops or traded for food vouchers. I earned enough money to keep from going hungry, which is more than a lot of neighbors could say. My years after my mom, the years after my mom died, I spent a lot of time wallowing in self pity and despair i tried to look on the bright side to remind myself that orphan or not i was still better off than most of the kids in africa and asia and north america too i had always had a roof over my head and more than enough food to eat and i had the oasis my life wasn't so bad at least that's what i kept tying myself in a vain in a vain attempt to starve off the effort epic loneliness now i now felt then the hunt for holidays easter egg began that was that was say that was what saved me i think suddenly i found something worth doing a dream worth chasing for the last five years the hunt have given me a goal and purpose a quest to fulfill a reason to get up in the morning Something to look forward to. The moment I began searching for the egg, the future no, no, no longer seemed so bleak. I was halfway through the fourth episode of the Family Ties mini mar marathon when the laundry room cracked open. My aunt Alice walked in. A, a moralish harpy, harpy in a house coat, clutching a basket of dirty clothes. She looked for more. She looked more lucid than usual, which was bad news. She was much easier to deal with when she was high. She glanced over at me with the usual look to, of dis, disdain and started to glance and started to look load her closer into the washer with it. Then her expression changed and peeked around the dryer to get a look at me. Her eyes went wide when she she spotted my laptop. I quickly. I quickly closed and began to shove in my backpack. I knew, I knew it was already too late. Hand it over, Wade, she ordered, reaching for my laptop. I can pawn it to help pay our rent. No, I shouted, shouted, twisting it away from her. Come on, Aunt Alice, I need it for school. What you need is to show some gratitude, she barked. Everyone else around here has to pay rent. I'm tired of you le leeching off of, off of me. You keep all my food vouchers, and that's more than covers share my rent. 
The hell it does. She tried again to grab the laptop out of my hand, but I refused to let go of it. So she turned quickly and stomped back to her room. I knew what was coming next. I quickly entered a command on my laptop that locked its keyboard and erased the hard drive. Aunt Alice returned a few seconds later with her boyfriend, Rick. <coughs> he was still half asleep. Rick was perpetually shirtless because he liked to show off his impressive collection of prison tattoos without saying a word. He walked over and raised a fist at me threateningly. I flinched and handed over the laptop. Then he and Aunt Alice walked out already discussing how much the computer might fetch at the pawn shop. Losing the laptop wasn't a big deal. I had two spirits stowed in my hideout, but they weren't nearly as fast, and I would have to reload all of my media onto it from the back of drives. A total pain, pain in the A, but it was my own fault. I knew the risk of bringing any value back here. Back here, the dark blue light of dawn was starting to creep through the laundry window. I decided it might be a good idea to leave for school a little early today. I dressed quickly and quietly as possible, pulling the worn corduroys, baggy sweater, and oversized coat that comprised my entire winter wardrobe. Then I put on my backpack and climbed to the washing machine. After pulling my gloves, I slid open a frost-covered window. The arctic morning air stung my cheeks. I gazed out over the uneven sea of the trailer rooftops. My aunt's trailer was at the top of the unit in a stack, 22 home, mobile homes high. Make it a lo level or two taller than the majority of the stacks immediately surrounding the the trailer on the bottom of the level rested on the ground or on the original con concrete foundations, but the units that above them suspended on, on a reinforced modular scaffold and haphazard metal lathic work had been construction precimo over the years. That's it for right now because I'm going to have to go pretty soon. That's part one of chapter one or whatever, chapter two.